Hi everyone and welcome to the Pre-Hospital and Disaster Medicine podcast series. This is podcast number seven for the World Association of Disaster and Emergency Medicine. My name is Joe Cuthbertson. Uh, for today's podcast, we're talking to Dr. Marta, Marta Caviglia and Dr. Ricardo Busson from Crimidum and Doctors with Africa respectively. And they've recently published uh, an article in Pre-Hospital and Disaster Medicine, the National Emergency Medical Service role during the COVID-19 pandemic in Sierra Leone. Welcome, Marta. Welcome, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. It's, it's a pleasure being here. It's great to have you along. Uh, Thank I'll, you very I was much. Wondering, thanks, Ricardo. Great to have you, have you both here. Uh, you've, you've been doing some really interesting work uh, in Sierra Leone. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it before we go into the article. Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, well, as, as a background, I am an anesthesiologist and then critical care physician, uh, but I'm also um, a researcher at Crimadim, that is a research center in emergency and disaster medicine. And we, together with the uh, doctors with Africa Kuam, have been involved in this uh, huge project that uh, basically uh, has as a, a main goal to create the very first uh, um, national emergency medical service in Sierra Leone. And for us, for Crimedim, um, apart from uh, um, cre drafting the first, uh, um, the first idea of the project, we've been mainly involved in the educational part. So myself, uh, I have been filled the role of a training manager um, in, in the training activities of, of, the, of the NEMS. And, and I'm the, the director of operation, but I've been the director of operation of the National Emergency Medical Service for the last uh, two and a half year. Um, I work with Doctors with Africa, Kuam. Kuam is an, an international um, NGO who works with uh, works in the health field and is in Sierra Leone since uh, many years working uh, at the beginning just in uh, one district and then expanding the action um, and the projects. Uh, the NEMS start uh, 2018 in January and uh, as Marta said, is the idea of creating from scratch a referral system for the whole country, a country with a population of uh, almost 8 million people and a uh, project involving around 1,000 employees. Uh, Kuam was not alone in the, developing this project, but together with Crimedim and with uh, Regione Veneto, this consortium created this, this project. And uh, the project has been now handed over to the government of Sierra Leone in the, the two months ago and is now still running under the management of the Minister of Health. That's a, a wonderful project and great to see that it's bedded down and still continuing. Uh, in reference to, to the work that you've been doing uh, and this uh, recent publication, what's been the impact of COVID-19 on Sierra Leone? Well, so um, Sierra Leone reported uh, the very first case of COVID-19 on the 31st of March in 2020. But already five days before, actually six, on the 25th of March, um, the government had uh, already declared the emergency, the emergency state in the country. So I think it's worth mentioning that Sierra Leone uh, already experienced something, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't really say similar because what happened with Ebola in uh, 2014 and 16 was far more tragic and severe as it, re it killed nearly uh, 4,000 people. But everybody still has a um, very vivid memory of that time. And at the government level, nobody wanted to be um, sort of caught off guard with this COVID-19. So they acted very quickly and with determination. Um, approximately one week after this first case was detected, uh, all those recommendations that we are now unfortunately used to, um, uh, to have, such as travel restrictions, um, curfew, face masks on, and, and so on, were put in place nationally. So they were very fast. 
Uh, now, Sierra Leone remains one of the least developed countries in the world. And um, despite the government readiness and people collaboration, uh, COVID-19 definitely represents uh, an added burden on the country health system uh, that was already fragile and then still suffers from uh, uh, many, many challenges. Uh, we have a, a chronic shortage of human resources, we have lack of equipment, we have lack of basic essential medicines. And um, I think also it is important to underline that uh, the health sector is not only dealing with direct victim of COVID-19, uh, but we also have uh, all those uh, indirect victims, you know, people that do not go to the hospital due to fear and then this cause delay of the treatment of COVID itself, but also for uh, other very common disease like malaria, for instance. Moreover, uh, we need to take in account that uh, any resources diverted to face the pandemic can impact the prevention and treatment of these other illness. And I, and I quote again malaria because it's one of the disease, uh, the most frequent disease uh, affecting the country. Uh, and this is something that uh, actually happened also during the Ebola pandemic. The difference that I can see now is, is uh, um, the presence of NEMS. So now, now we have NEMS, uh, the National Emergency Medical System, that is actually actively boosting this emergency response to, to the pandemic. Still, I would say that uh, as for every country worldwide, it, it is a difficult situation and a situation that can be uh, potentially disruptive for, for the nation itself. Um, if you want to have a, an idea of the nation, of the numbers at the moment, um, at the moment what it, it's reported from the government is a total of uh, roughly 2,000, 2,300 cases with a, a total of 74 deaths due to COVID-19. I see. So, so given that experience with Ebola, and the formation of the, the National Emergency Medical Service. What are the main measures and main strategies that uh, the health system has put in place in Sierra Leone, given those challenges to, to combat COVID-19? Um, so the, the, the first action that has been taken by the, the Minister of Health was to reactivate the EOC, the um, Emergency Operations Centre, uh, to supervise and manage all the operation. Being NEMS the only system for the referral of, uh, of patients in the hospitals, we have been immediately involved uh, also for the response of COVID-19 inside the case management pillar. So basically what we did as NEMS, we start uh, immediately dedicating some of our ambulances only for COVID-19 patients. This also, again, with the idea uh, and remembering what happened with Ebola, when the patients were really scared of using the ambulances, uh, associating the ambulances to Ebola, the idea was to try to save the referral system for other, um, other, other patients, uh, passing the message that the ambulances were very safe because none of the normal ambulances were used for COVID-19 patients. So we decided to separate and to create two parallel uh, referral systems. At the beginning, dedicating eight ambulances to uh, COVID, uh, four on the point of entry, so one in the airport and three in the main um, land borders, and four, one per region. Uh, in a second phase, after the first month, uh, with the increase of number of cases, we um, increased the number of ambulances dedicated to COVID to 15, one per district uh, and three in Freetown, that is the, the capital city where of most of the cases were. Um, this create, of course, uh, a change in our system because we were running a referral system for all the patients with 81 ambulances and now 15 ambulances were dedicated only to uh, COVID-19, so we had the remaining 66 to cover all the other sicknesses that were still there. So the number of patients actually increased a lot and also increased the number uh, of our referrals and also kilometers uh, to run and so also the cost from a budget point of view. What we did is uh, we moved all the COVID-19 ambulances to the main city 
of each district where actually the um, uh, government hospital is located to facilitate also the, the referrals to the hospitals. So as I was saying, there are only uh, five labs in, um, in Sierra Leone and four of them are in free towns and the laboratory pillar, they don't, oh, they didn't have a referral system uh, in place to uh, move the samples from the different villages to the labs. So they ask our support and with our ambulances, we create a system to uh, support the um, sample referrals actually with the same um, COVID ambulances once we finished with the uh, patient of the day we dedicate the ambulance to move the sample so we were able to support with one movement per day from each district to uh, the dedicated lab and this allow the the lab team to have daily updates and day, daily collection of samples um, so then regard another change is I was saying is in the has been in the software. We have a in-house developed software for our operators to do the triage of all the patients. So we had to update this software also with the COVID. Uh, so we create a specific COVID page where also the our staff were able to collect the vitals of the patient and these vitals were then communicated to the referral hospital. So the hospital, to, to, to support the hospital and to have the hospital more prepared when we are referring the, the patients. So from a communication point of view, basically what happened every day is that the EOC that is man was managing completely all and supervising all the pillars were receiving the results uh, from the lab pillar, they were moving immediately the psychosocial uh, workers to support and to, uh, to have the patient aware that they, they need to be moved to the hospitals because one of the challenges in Sierra Leone is that each patient has to be moved to the hospital even if it was asymptomatic because there was no chances for the most of the of the population to be to be self isolated so all the patients were moved to either community center or treatment center and um, so first first step was the psychosocial team to go there and have the the patient aware and to accept to be moved to the hospital after that our ambulance were dispatched to, call, to pick up the patient and move to the uh, designated uh, treatment center or community center, depend, depends if it was a severe case or only a mild case. And um, so another, another measure that we, we had to adopt to the, due to the COVID was of course the change in the use of the PPE. So we trained our staff, the specific staff for the COVID ambulance in um, how to manage the COVID case and also how to dress and how to use the correct PPEs. And we have to purchase them and of course to, to distribute all around the country. Wow, that's a, a really comprehensive operational uh, approach to, to tackling COVID-19 in Sierra Leone. Uh, I'm wondering if you if you'd be able to describe the role of education and training, given the the background to the development of this service uh, and then the intersection with COVID-19. What, what role did education and training play in uh, your response? Uh, well, so when the pandemic occurred, um, our need at the mo at the moment was to train fast uh, a large number of people. Um, you see, NEMS has something like a thousand people working uh, in the pre-hospital, so on the ground, plus other 30 operators uh, working at the dispatch center in Freetown. Um, well, at the very beginning of the, of the project, when NEMS started, uh, we trained a pool of eight local trainers uh, led by a, a training manager. And as I said, actually, it's a position that I have filled for quite some time. 
Um, and these trainers were supported by an international pool of doctors and, and nurses that sort of uh, came and went. So um, we had these different sort of uh, itinerant training courses in all the districts before the activation of NEMS. Of course, with COVID, we could not replicate this uh, strategy um, as we needed to reduce the movement across the country. And of course, we couldn't have uh, all those expats uh, coming to Sierra Leone in support of local trainers. So what we did was uh, with COVID was a series of uh, just-in-time trainings uh, and I would like actually to take this chance to thank our local team and acknowledge their amazing job because they did this alone. They provided a one day training uh, at first uh, only to the 98, 100 paramedics and an ambulance drivers identified for the management of COVID-19 cases. But then this training was expanded to cover all the, uh, the remaining ambulance teams. And it was a training um, basically based on um, the new COVID standard operating procedure to be adopt adopted on the ambulances. Case definition, as Ricardo said, the use of uh, uh, PPEs and uh, IPC procedure. So the main goal was to teach the teams how to work safely, protecting themselves and also helping containing the spread of the disease. In parallel, uh, as we needed to upgrade the software, we needed that all the operators uh, knew how to use this software. So also the 30 OC operators received a special training focusing again on COVID case definition, the triage system and the new dispatch procedure. And I think it was a, a huge work that was uh, carried on in a, a very short amount of time. So again, I would like to to thank uh, our local team for the great the great job done. Well deserved. Uh, given the amount of work that's been done in such a short space of time, and, and like you you mentioned earlier, Sierra Leone does face its challenges. What were the main challenges that um, yourselves and, and the health teams in Sierra Leone faced when responding to COVID nineteen? Uh, but the challenges were many. I would group them uh, in three three different groups. The first one is resources, so lack of resources, uh, or, or maybe delays on the resources coming. So at the beginning, we have of course to to reorganize our system and also to uh, to, man to to see the increase of costs uh, using our own resources. But this was not only a problem for us, but also a problem all around for the country. Uh, resources were needed for the allowances for the staff to work, to increase the number of allowances, also um, to uh, establish the treatment center and the community center in all the districts. It took a lot of, it, it took a lot of resources. And, uh, and these resources were not so many. And so I would say that being, I mean, you can imagine Sierra Leone being a low income country, uh, resources were uh, are not so many. So to manage in the right way, the few resources we had was uh, of course one of the main challenges. Um, a second part for me is regarding the context. Um, again, in Sierra Leone, as I was saying before, is not there, are, there is no possibility for most of the citizens to be self-isolated, as well as it's not possible to have uh, a lockdown. If you if you think that most of people they don't have electricity, they don't have fridge, most maybe they don't have water available on a daily basis, uh, they don't have maybe money to stay close in the house or to buy uh, food for a week, so they have to go every. day uh, to work or to fund the money to buy the meal for the same day. Uh, it's probably one of the main reasons why the, the government uh, never did a lockdown apart for uh, two or three days. But there is not, not differently. I mean, compared to Europe, the, the, the answers and were, was really different. Uh, but this was due to the context. And a third main challenge probably is the, the experience they have with Ebola. So as I was saying before, in, during Ebola, the ambulances were seen as uh, transportation of death. And were, the, the ambulances were seen as dangerous. And so we had 
at the beginning, and that's why we decided at the beginning to split the referral system into two. But in any case, we had problems with violence. We had ambulances that has been attacked in different communities. Also, one of our operators has been stabbed, and uh, the, there has been different episodes of violence because people were scared, where they, they were scared that the ambulances were actually uh, transporting the virus in the communities instead of saving uh, or moving the patients already contaminated uh, away from the community. So this, is, this was uh, really challenging for us. And also the same fear of, of, uh, um, of Ebola, of, of the ambulances were also seen for the hospitals. And that's why I was saying at the beginning, the first ones to go to the patients were, uh, was the psychological team. Because they had to convince the patient that it was better to be moved to the hospital and not to stay at home. Because most of the patients, they were scared. They, they were asymptomatic, so they were saying, there is where, is where I can get the virus. So it was really challenging in some cases to move. Sometimes we, they, we have to ask the support of the army or the police to be able to move the patients um, to the hospitals and to assure the safety of the ambulances. Well, there's some significant context there. Uh, look, Fantastic job to, to both of you and the, and the teams that you're working with uh, in Sierra Leone. And thanks so much for taking the time with us to, to discuss your research findings and the, the great work that you're doing in Sierra Leone. It's been great to speak with you, Marta and Ricardo. Um, thank, you, thank you again for, for your time today. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Yes, thank you very much for having us. Okay, that wraps up our seventh podcast for pre-hospital and disaster medicine. My name is Joe Cuthbertson. See you at the next podcast series. Good day. <laughs>